be a little a little column of, of mocking people. It's too it's too deep a journey, a book, so is a play. You have to you actually have to love the characters you're writing about along with and at the same time of describing their weaknesses, their longings, their failings. And that's only done through being very serious about it. By serious, I mean entering into their thoughts and their demons and their wishes and their frailties. How many more books did you have banned? Oh, a good lot. Oh, I had a, I had a, I have a trophy of of banning. It was, I mean, Miles Nicopoli wrote used to write brilliantly about it, and I have been told that he did write one column in which I was referred to. You know, one of the turnip culture. That's what he called the country people. Ah, the turnip culture ones, saying I was I was lucky to have been banned because it brought attention that mightn't have come otherwise. <laughs> but at the same time, and one can't be too flippant about it, I was as well hurt. To write a book is a very hard thing. And, uh, you have to live in it even though the first book took me a very short time. I had to live in it. Each book takes longer now. And somehow to be dismissed unfairly, as sometimes happens, that does hurt, but it must not, or I hope it has not, made one embittered. How long did it take for your rehabilitation? Well... I think tourism helped. <laughs> All sorts of things helped. And I was on television. Perhaps being interviewed by you helped. Mm. I somehow moved from the disgrace counter <laughs> to the novelty counter, if you know and, what I and mean. And with your family, I mean, did your parents live to see your rehabilitation? Ah, yes, I think so. My mother had a photograph of me, which Lord Snowden, Tony Snowden, had taken for one of my books. Very beautiful photograph beside an old-fashioned lamp, one of her lamps, actually. Mm -hmm. Old-fashioned lamp with the glass globe, you know, those lamps. A glass bowl and a high globe, and you can see the oil in... The... Anyhow, he took that photograph, and I had it enlarged, or he got it enlarged, and it was, we sent it to my mother, and she had it on the wall. She had it framed. And in her later life, she, was, she loved a bit of company and she used to keep people for bed and breakfast in the summer when the house didn't have to be heated so much. And one day, uh, one of the visitors bed and breakfast, because she used to chat to them in the morning when they had their tea and mandarin oranges and so oh. on. And uh, he said, oh, I think I recognised that photograph. And my mother said, that's my daughter. He had seen or read one of my books. Now, this I will be accused of being boastful, but you're going to have to be, <laughs> as I began the blessed story. He said, oh, you know, she's as famous as De Valera. Well, I'm not, A. <laughs> B. <laughs> I would have preferred James Joyce or Samuel Beckett. Mm. Had been, But my mother, that was a great appeasement. Yeah. And... It, it seems a very s slight or trivial thing to talk about, but being accepted elsewhere helped to, to be accepted at home. Before coming back to The Country Girls, which I want to, because to see it not as a book but as a play will be yeah. a, 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 a oh, new experience. Oh, it'll be um, lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> in, in terms of your uh, more recent writing where you've looked at contemporary events in, in Ireland yes. and your take on... Um, the Celtic tiger and what it did to us. I mean, how, how badly scarred have we been by all of that? I think very badly. You know that. You interview people all the time. You go around the country. Money became the god. God and money was, was on everybody's agenda. Those who piled it up and ripped off their own and those who didn't have it and knew that they were or feared they were being ripped off. I mean, I read something the other day uh, that one of the, and I don't know which one because I haven't been following it and been busy with rehearsal, that one of the presidential candidates, to his great shame, I, I truly forget which one it was, but he said, you know, being president isn't about poetry readings. And I thought, come on a minute, there's no need to deride poetry readings. Ireland had great literature. It has a legacy of great literature. Great literature is essential to the psyche of a nation. It's as essential as their failed Celtic tiger 
And for him to ridicule or dismiss poetry reading, I thought, that's not right. So the harm that was done, everybody knows the financial harm. You read it every day, cuts, 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 hospitals. I read such painful things, even this morning. Uh, people who are incontinent, will they get the pads that they need for, and mm. so on? We all know that, but we also know that what what is greatest about Irish people, and I am not sentimental about this, is their gift of language or their potential gift for language. And the thing I started out when I started to talk to you, they still have here in Dublin and down the country, Waterford and elsewhere, you meet people still with that sense of original wonder about life, of not being blasé, not being totally obsessed with money, but of looking, for instance, at nature, of looking at our literature, of looking at history, and above all, of looking at each other. There's a lovely story called The Rug. This is from uh, Mary, who says, uh, featuring your mother, and always sees her mother opening that parcel. That's from Mary, who recollects that story. Other people saying, aren't you a tonic? Which is <laughs> great to hear. Uh, let's see what else we have. Listening to Edna O'Brien, let me move this down, reminded me of the time that as a child in the 1960s, I discovered the country girls hidden under my mother's mattress. There were more country girls <laughs> under mattresses than there are mattresses. <laughs> I vaguely remember talk about it in the newspapers at the time as a dirty book. How she managed to get her hands Hands on it. I'm not sure. That's from uh, from Dermot. And uh, it, was it true that a few copies of your book, when it was published, re recently published, surfaced in a bookshop in in Limerick, and the parish priest of Chumgraney managed to buy them and bring them back to the parish church and. Well, there was, a, there was a little mini burning, yes. Not quite bonfire <laughs> of the vanities, but it was not the parish priest. So two two women, lovelorn women in the town, had bought the book, and the parish priest requested they be brought in. And the little thing happened in the... It was cold evening, so a fire was no harm. <laughs> but all that, you know, I don't talk about it much simply because I'm more interested in what I'm doing now and what I will be doing than in the fact that... But it is relevant burnt. now because it you've now relevant. written the... Oh, yes, it's ironic. It's ironic. We had our first preview in Waterford on, on, on Friday evening and I will never forget it. They have booked out for the first preview and the second, and women, some not young, you know, with the grey hair, women my age, uh, all coming up to me and saying, isn't it wonderful that the country girls has come back? And it shows, it's not just a moment of pride or happiness for me, which it is, how far people have moved on and what was thought to be scatological or unsavoury or terrible no longer is. But I want to say this, and it's important for me that I say it. I didn't sit down and decide, oh, I will adapt the country girls and make, put it, you know, on the stage, take the first scene, the second scene, you know, like what I call like a wardrobe or an alphabet. I love theatre. I love radical theatre, theatre with movement and river fluidity to it. And I didn't even look at the book. I know the characters, Baba, mm -hmm. Kate, Mr. Gentleman. They walk through my mind day and night. So I made a play of a totally, in a totally different m meteor and medium. And I was lucky enough to find what I know. Many people will be jealous, but I know I found the best director in Ireland for this play, Michael Murphy. He is fantastic. And the other evening, I was not there. He paid me the compliment. Dir directors usually don't like writers because writers are a nuisance to them. But apparently, not in this case. Michael mm. Murphy, they were rehearsing, doing it again and again before the first show. And he looked at his cast, all of them who are really working. Oh, are they working like dream boats? And he said, you know what? I'd like to have a part in this play. <laughs> <laughs> but he can't get it between now and tomorrow night mm. opening. Well, you've had your previews and you're opening tomorrow night and running until Saturday in Waterford in the Garter Lane No, Theatre. no, two and a half weeks in Waterford and then starting in the Gaiety 
on November the 7th. Yeah, I just want to get my dates right because I'm a bit lost in October you at the are, moment. You um, are. You start at Friday with well, previews. Well, first night is tomorrow night. Yeah, first night officially is tomorrow 18th night. 18th of October. And then you're running until Saturday the 5th of November. Exactly. And then a and quick then break. Straight up in a up lorry. Up to Dublin. Yeah, with in, the set. In the lorry. With, in the lorry, <laughs> with the cast. And it's for one week at the Gaiety, but then after availability after Christmas, we're hoping with all this talk I've been giving to you about it, we're hoping we'll have a longer life. Please tell Edna my mother bought me The Country Girls for my 16th birthday and I still have it alongside all of Edna's books. I still love reading The Country Girls. That's uh, from Anya. Um, you didn't, uh, you weren't tempted to move it into the, the 21st century, were you? Ah, uh, if something has a life, it doesn't matter whether it's the 21st century or the 3rd century. You don't move O'Casey okay, up to the, the 21st no, century. No, but it's, it's the energy, it's the engine, it's the inner dynamic that matters. And it would, wouldn't be... And also, I didn't tell you, I think it has some wonderful songs and music. I stole those from uh, the archives, you know, that were relevant to the story and to the time. Uh, here's another one, a final one. I told this story to Edna O'Brien's son recently. I hope he remembered to pass it on to her. I went to school in Boyle and Roscommon in the 1960s. My English teacher was a priest who did parish work in the USA during the summers. He would smuggle back her books and read them to us in English class, swearing us to secrecy. He inspired, uh, his inspired teaching encouraged me to become a writer. R.I.P. Noel Matimo. That's from well, John Mulligan. I had, a, I had two friends of priest. Obviously, this man, it was rather brave of him, and Father Peter Connolly at a time when the book came out, The Country Girls, and I was being harangued and, and uh, pilloried all over the place, held a meeting in Limerick uh, defending me. So I have some little corner within the fold. Final one. Any chance of Edna standing for president? She would be elected tomorrow. There you go. Would I, well, <laughs> is it too late? It is too late. Are yes. you sure? <laughs> Absolutely certain. Edna O'Brien, thank you very much for joining us in the studio thank today. Thank you, Pat. Thank you.